For 30 years, Joe Bonanno's authority in the underworld went unchallenged. Bonanno has never been touched, never in an attempt made on his life. He witnessed the rise and fall of the mob and lived to tell the tale. Everybody was afraid of Joe Bonanno when he chose to be scary. You often hear about the person who enters a room and all eyes are drawn to that person. He was that kind of man. The mob boss tried to preserve his traditions by inducting his oldest son into the secret society he had created. I am not ashamed of who I am or what I am. I've accepted the life that was handed to me and I've tried to do the best that I can. But the godfather and his son would find themselves betrayed by their own crime family. centuries, the island of Sicily has been a breeding ground for renegades, radicals, and gangsters. The island comes by its rebellious spirit naturally enough. Foreigners kept invading it and ruling over it. As a result, Sicilians became deeply suspicious of outsiders and fiercely antagonistic toward authority. This spirit gave rise to the Sicilian Mafia, and it was into this world that Giuseppe Bonanno was born on January 18, 1905. His father, Salvatore, was a wealthy mafia leader who owned farmland, vineyards, and cattle. Salvatore was proud to be the descendant of a medieval architect who built the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Even in those days, we couldn't do anything straight. You know, we built a crooked building. <laughs> Giuseppe's mother, Catherine, was one of 18 children from the Bonventri family, an ally of the Bonanno clan in the feuding village of Castellamare del Golfo. Salvatore was considered a man of respect to the mostly poor people of Castellamare who turned to mafia families like his for justice. He arbitrated disputes, controlled jobs, influenced politicians, and when necessary, used violence to get his way. The Bananos were really part of a kingdom, a kingdom of, of within Sicily that was anything but recognized by the regime in Sicily, but was certainly respected by the ordinary people of Sicily. In 1908, on the run from the law, Salvatore brought his wife and only child to America. It was a great adventure for three-year-old Giuseppe, who became known as Joe to his first grade classmates in Brooklyn, New York. On weekends, his father would take him for walks through the bustling city streets, and they would stop at the Nickelodeon. The boy fell in love with America. But in 1912, much to Joe's disappointment, the Bonanos moved back to Sicily, when serious feuding threatened the family's power and wealth. What was dear to him, what was sacred to him, was his early American experience. Because, in fact, when he went back to the old country, he was called the American Kid. His earliest memories were of America. But Joe would spend the rest of his childhood absorbing the tough spirit of his native land. As he rode his horse by the sea, he fancied himself a knight fighting for honor, or the captain of a ship that circles the globe. Even as a boy, he had great expectations. Joe grew up expecting to be a man of substance, a man of wealth and influence and power. He's raised in certain rhetorical traditions of honor and deference to a great leader, a great man. At the age of 11, Joe's idyllic childhood was cut short. His father, drafted to fight for Italy in World War I, returned home badly wounded. Salvatore's dying words to his son were, your name is Bonanno, always be proud of your name. Only five years later, his mother died as well. Just a teenager, the orphan inherited his family's fortune. Joe grew up fast. He's on his own from the age of 15, 16. And uh, there's a native shrewdness there. Joe soon became disgusted with his uncle's feuding over his inheritance. At 17, he decided to take what he needed and leave Castellamare behind. He enrolled in a nautical college based in Palermo, the capital of Sicily. More than anything, Joe wanted to be a commander of men. 
His ambition was to go into, into college and become a naval officer in the Italian Merchant Marine. And just about the time he was ready to accomplish that, some little fellow in Rome by the name of Mussolini came into power and decided that all those Sicilians down there needed to be taught a lesson. <laughs> by 1924, Palermo was feeling the sting of fascist depression. In the romantic tradition of his ancestors, Joe was ready to fight. He formed a radical student organization that denounced Mussolini. The Naval Academy responded by suspending Bonanno, and he never graduated. When the fascist police started torturing and killing Sicilians with mafia connections, Joe made a decision. I guess it's time for me to go home, is the way he put it. And I, when he first told me that story, I, I said, what do you mean, time to go home? He said, I think I better go back to America. Bonanno arrived in New York in December 1924 and found a city in the midst of a wild spree brought on by the misguided law called Prohibition. Gangsters all over America were getting rich as bootleggers. Joe had an uncle in New York who wanted to train him to become a barber, but Joe was determined to prove himself as a bootlegger. It's just a lot more fun to be a gangster than it is to be a barber. It's thrilling. You're out playing cops and robbers at night and making deliveries and getting paid. And it was an adventure for a young man just arrived in America, and it was a lot of easy money. Joe settled into a Brooklyn neighborhood made up of fellow immigrants from Castellamare, including a hero of Joe's from the old country, Salvatore Maranzano. A charismatic and dashing man of respect was fascinated by the Roman Empire. He even spoke some Latin. Maranzano was taught, disciplined, a bit of a reader for a gangster. He actually had books in his home, and Joe just loves him. He feels enhanced when he's around him. You could say that Maranzano is a substitute father. Maranzano recognized Joe's cunning and aptitude and put him in charge of his thriving bootleg operation. Joe quickly developed a reputation for being tough as well as smart. Once when a local Don tried to muscle in on his business, Joe wasted no time setting the man straight. My father found out about it, told him, forget about it. One word led to another. He happened to have a weapon on him. He took the gun, stuck it in the guy's mouth, and said, if you don't back away, you're not going to live to see tomorrow. The guy backed away. Joe had humiliated the man and was summoned by Maranzano and other local men of respect to account for his actions. What happened next set in motion a chain of events that would take decades to unravel. Bonanno contacted his older cousin, Stefano Magadino, who was running his own rackets in upstate Buffalo, New York, and who considered himself the most senior leader of the Castellamarese immigrants. Magadino came down to the city prepared to defend his younger cousin's honor and demonstrate his own authority. But at the sit-down, Magadino did not get a chance to play the role of godfather and peacemaker, because Joe's new mentor, Maranzano, jumped to the young man's defense. Maranzano said, wait a minute. Here's the guy that was protecting what is his. How can we fault him for that? The other gangsters agreed. Joe was exonerated. Now it was Joe's cousin, Magadino, the black sheep of the family back in Sicily, who felt humiliated, dishonored, and denied the respect he thought he deserved. What developed out of that meeting was an insatiable jealousy on the part of Stefano Magadino toward my father. Here was this younger whippersnapper cousin of mine coming from the old country, and immediately he's now in the good graces of quote unquote important people in New York. The bitter Stefano retreated to upstate New York, but as Joe's stature continued to grow, so did his cousin's resentment. By 1930, Joe had carved out a coveted role as Maranzano's chief aide. Though not yet a man of respect, he was a man to be reckoned with. Joe had presence, he had charisma, he had that undefinable quality that makes people defer to a leader. We would sit in his study and discuss Mediterranean history, discuss modern history, discuss politics, discuss opera. 
He was truly a Renaissance man. At 25 years old, Joe's charm and smarts had taken him far. But he had yet to be tested in battle. Bonanno would get his chance as the New York underworld erupted in street warfare. Wielding a machine gun to fight for his clan, Joe would become a full-fledged gangster and in the process, win a place for himself at the founding of the modern American Mafia. By the time he was 25 years old, Joe Bonanno was a successful bootlegger and a rising leader in the New York underworld. His mentor, Salvatore Maranzano, even made Joe his chief aide. Now he wanted Bonanno to marry his own daughter. But Joe was already in love with Faye Labruzzo, a quiet seamstress with a dry sense of humor. The courtship was interrupted in 1930 when an old Sicilian feud reignited in the streets of Brooklyn and Manhattan. It got so dangerous that Joe kissed his girlfriend goodbye. He bought himself a bulletproof Cadillac equipped with built-in submachine guns and went into hiding. Bonanno and his cronies were fighting against the most powerful Italian gangster in all of New York, Joe the Boss Masseria. The tightly knit Costello-Marese were becoming too independent for the power-hungry Masseria. As the bodies piled up, the gangsters were losing profits and losing patience. Masseria's right-hand man and Joe Bonanno's arch-enemy, Charles Lucky Luciano, took control of the chaos. Charlie Lucky was an Americanized product, born in Sicily, but came over here at a very early age. So he and his friends decided that the shooting that was going on wasn't good for business. So Luciano orchestrated the assassination of his own boss, Masseria, in order to make peace with Joe's boss, Maranzano. After the killing, Joe and the other major New York gangsters all attended a crucial meeting hosted by Al Capone at the Congress Hotel in Chicago. The conclusion of that meeting was the establishment of Un Comitato de Pasha, which was a committee for peace. However, because there were some Americanized guys that couldn't say the words correctly, they decided to say, well, let's call it the commission. <laughs> Joe's boss, Maranzano, pushed through his plan for a syndicate of mafia families that would function like the Roman military led by Caesar. The other leaders quickly realized they had replaced one despot for another. Four months later, Lucky had Maranzano killed as well. With his boss dead, Joe decided the best course was not to avenge the murder, but to make peace with Lucky Luciano. There was a meeting in 1931 between my father and Luciano, where my father said, I have no reason to have any problems with you. Do you have any problems with me? They agreed to agree to a peace. It was a peace agreement with a huge dividend for the career of Joe Bonanno. He's perfectly happy with the outcome, which is it delivers the family that had belonged to Maranzano to Joe Bonanno. So all of a sudden, at the age of 26, he's a mafia boss. In keeping with his Sicilian tradition, Joe became a father, and his fellow immigrants were his family. Then Bonanno and Luciano created a new commission, which would hold sway in the underworld for the next half a century. The commission works beautifully for decades because there is no big boss. It's seven top mafia guys, and they meet every five years, and they just operate by consensus. With the war behind him, Joe Bonanno married the patient Faye Labruzzo in 1931, almost two years after their original wedding date. At the ceremony, several of the bridegrooms carried pistols under their tuxedos in case of surprise visitors. A year later, Joe and Faye had a son. They named him Salvatore, after the baby's grandfather. By the mid-1930s, the two leaders of the commission had gone their separate ways. Lucky Luciano became a household name, while Joe Bonanno remained unknown to the public. I think he saw that Luciano got in trouble because he loved to be in the spotlight. He would be seen at nightclubs and photographed and in the society columns and newspapers. Bonanno stays out of the paper. I mean, for decades, he never appears in the newspapers. 
Joe Bonanno concentrated on the traditional staples of the Mafia, bookmaking, gambling, and loan sharking. The dark underside of these activities, extortion and violence, was inevitable. But Joe reasoned that if he instilled enough fear in his followers, then he wouldn't have to resort to violence. Fear is what a Mafia family runs on. No one could be the head of one of the five New York families without being responsible for many murders. And I'm sure Joe ordered any number of killings. Everybody was afraid of Joe Bonanno when he chose to be scary. Like other shrewd godfathers, Joe was also involved in legitimate businesses such as a cheese factory and a ladies' coat manufacturer. In an interview years later, he would deny that he ever gained control of any business through extortion. Some people come to see you because you are a big man. They, on their own, they say, Mr. Bonanno, I want to be a partner. Joe never directly explained his line of work to his young son, Salvatore, known as Bill, and his daughter, Catherine. They slowly realized that their father was someone special by observing the people around him. One day, Bill painted the cars of his father's associates with orange house paint. The men never even said a word about the prank to their godfather. And that told me something. It told me that uh, I could get away with certain things, not because of who I was, but because of who my father was. In the spring of 1941, with Joe's personal driver at the wheel, Bonanno and his family headed west in a Cadillac. Eight-year-old Bill had developed a serious inner ear infection, and the doctor recommended a drier climate. Joe settled on a boarding school for Bill in Tucson, Arizona, and this became the family's part-time home. In high school, Bill lived alone in Tucson for several months of the year. While his father was spending much of his time running the crime family in New York, Bill tried his own hand at crime, stealing hubcaps and running guns into Mexico. When Joe got wind of his son's activities, he decided it was time to bring him into a world where he would be held accountable for his actions. One night in Brooklyn, 22-year-old Bill was mysteriously called to a house where men he had known his whole life were waiting. The men began telling him the history of the Mafia, a secret society to which they wanted him to pledge his life. Tossing a piece of burning paper in his hands, Bill proclaimed his allegiance, saying, This is how I burn if I expose this world of ours. It was a profound experience for the young man. He realized he was entering a new stage of life where his commitment to his Mafia brethren and his father would always come first. Soon after Bill became a man in his father's world, he fell in love with Rosalie Profaci, a young woman he had known since childhood. Rosalie was the niece of Joseph Profaci, a friend of Joe Bonanno since the 1920s and a fellow founding member of the commission. The Godfather gave his eager blessing to the Union, and in 1956, Bill and Rosalie were married. Two of the most powerful Mafia families in America would be united. Never, never did my father ever tell me I had to marry anyone. However, he made it a point to make me understand who I was, what was expected of me in the future, and that it would be advisable and better if we married our own kind. At a point in time when the Mafia enjoyed unprecedented power, the wedding marked the pinnacle of prestige for Joe Bonanno. He spared no expense on the sumptuous celebration, which years later would be the inspiration for the famous wedding scene in the first Godfather movie. It was like the royal heads of Europe joining together by marrying off two of their offspring. It's a huge affair, the Hotel Astor, 3,000 guests, and there are cash gifts amounting to about $100,000 in 1956 dollars, which would be about a half a million dollars today, more or less. Among the entertainers there was Tony Bennett, who just hired, to, you know, like you would hire some neighborhood singer. Well, they just hired Tony Bennett to sing. The guest list read like a who's who of the American Mafia. Tommy Lucchese, 
Vito Genovese, Albert Anastasia, Tony Accardo, and Stefano Magadino were all there. All these people that came to my wedding came because of the respect and admiration they had for my father, not because of the bride and groom. Joe Bonanno surveyed his kingdom. He had recently brokered a peace between two rivals in the New York mob, Vito Genovese and Albert Anastasia. He called it the Pox Bonanno. Joe was the most respected man in the mafia, perhaps too respected for his own good. His brooding cousin, Stefano Magadino, was said to have remarked, look at all these people. It's going to Joe's head. No one at the wedding could have imagined just how swiftly the peace Bonanno created in the underworld was about to unravel and how Joe's authority would be fatally undermined. In August 1957, Godfather Joe Bonanno was as powerful as he would ever be. He had recently presided over his son's marriage, uniting two mafia families and solidifying a dynasty. It was a moment in history when the Mafia's influence permeated every layer of society. Now 52 years old, Joe felt secure about leaving New York to take a trip back to his native Sicily. He failed to notice that his fellow mob bosses were thrilled to see him go. In Italy, Joe was treated like royalty. He met with leaders of the Sicilian Mafia to brief them on the success of the commission in America. But the Godfather is believed to have had other, more pressing business to discuss as well. According to the later testimony of a Sicilian mafioso, he was really there to arrange narcotic shipments. That was part of his purpose there. Bonanno himself did not establish the lucrative narcotics trafficking operation. That was masterminded by a captain of his named Carmine Galante. Through Galante's connections in Sicily and France, the Mafia's drug trade flourished. All the while, Joe Bonanno would claim to be adamantly opposed to drug trafficking. If the time I on, without to my knowledge, the deal of narcotics, I never know. This, I don't have to swear, but I can swear on anything. Law enforcement officials say that Joe may have preached zero tolerance for narcotics, but when the vast drug money came into the family, he didn't turn it down. The idea that he was against drugs is absurd. It always was. They were the principal leaders of the drug trafficking in the United States for nearly 40 years. And they made millions and millions of dollars. Only a few years after the 1957 meeting in Palermo, Carmine Galante was convicted of narcotics trafficking and sentenced to 20 years in prison. But Joe Bonanno managed to elude the law. When Joe returned to New York in November 1957, he was shocked to find that in his absence, his Pax Bonanno had been shattered. The assassination of Albert Anastasia had thrown the commission into chaos. In response, Joe's cousin, Stefano Magadino, had called for an emergency national mob meeting in the tiny upstate New York town of Appalachian. The purpose? To install underboss Carlo Gambino as the new head of Anastasia's family. Joe Bonanno's authority was being put to the test by his fellow mobsters. They waited till he'd gone to Sicily before they put the contract on Anastasia. So it may be that what the whole thing means in terms of Bonanno's leadership within the commission is that they're trying to do an end run around him while he's out of the country. There is no real honor and loyalty. It comes down to personal ambitions, and personal ambitions will overcome anything. Joe was furious, not only because the violence was a clear challenge to his underworld leadership, but because the meeting would occur in the exact same place where the commission had met the year before, inviting unwanted attention from the law. Just as Joe had feared on November 14, 1957, the group of national mafia leaders was ambushed by local police. Fifty-eight men were detained, while many others fled on foot into the woods. Imagine maybe a hundred mafiosi caught in this little town out in the country with no plausible explanation of what they're doing there. It was terribly embarrassing and really the first great breakthrough in public awareness of the mafia. 
Joe was not even at the meeting, yet he was sought out and arrested along with the rest. His compatriots had unwittingly dealt him his first serious blow by thrusting him out of the cloak of secrecy and into the glare of publicity. The Godfather handled the exposure with style. Joe always looks composed. He's smiling, and it's as though he's saying, this is all ridiculous. I'm an honest businessman. I have no idea how I was caught up in this and accused of being a criminal. While The Godfather handled the press attention well, he did not appreciate the nickname that the New York papers gave him. It offended his deep pride in his family name. In the aftermath of Appalachian, the Bonanno's private lives became much more tense. There was a constant feeling of being watched, of cops lurking around every corner. I remember my father-in-law calling me, and I said, Oh, hello, Dad, you know, and he, he yelled at me. It was the first time he had ever scolded me. You know, you, know, you should never use a person's name when they call up. At the time, the FBI had begun secretly tapping mobsters' telephones, so the mafiosi were baffled as to how the Fed seemed to know about their most private conversations. I figured either I have a bug on me someplace, or someone very close to me has betrayed us. And it takes a lot of self-control not to let that seed of doubt grow and mushroom into you doing something that you might regret and hurt an innocent person. In 1963, Bonanno was further exposed when a low-level soldier named Joseph Falacci became the first member of the Mafia to break the mob's oath of silence. On national television, he was asked who performed the initiation rite when he was inducted into the Mafia. Joe Banana. Joe Banana? Yeah. Now, where God. is he? Is he uh, at the head of one of the families now? Yeah, he still is. He still is? Yeah. Still alive? Right. In the wake of the fresh publicity, 58-year-old Joe Banano fled New York for his home in Arizona. Joe, Faye, and their youngest child, Joe Jr., had long ago moved their permanent residence west. Now Joe began to think about retiring in Tucson. The Godfather asked his son Bill to look after things in his absence from New York. Our number three man was gravely ill, and I had been told, see what you can do to make life easy for him. And as a result of that, I started becoming his eyes and ears. Joe told his captains to elect a new number three man, or consigliere. Hoping to stay close to their cherished leader, the captains elected his son, Bill, and Joe proudly approved it. Bill later expressed his devotion in a poem he wrote to his father. It read, I stand stately in your shadow. It is an honor I covet. I accept the sins heaped upon me. I am a banano. Bill's resilience was tested right away. His promotion upset mafiosi inside and outside the family, who considered Bill a child of privilege with no experience of the city streets. Bill Bonanno had a bit of swagger and a bit of uh, maybe uh, evoking some of the spirit of fraternity life and football weekends in Arizona that did not quite conform to what an older mafia man's idea of a aspiring mafia leader should be. For the first time in decades, there were stirrings of rebellion within the Bonanno clan. Was Joe really setting the stage for making his son the boss? The brewing dissension now gave Joe's bitter cousin Stefano Magadino the opportunity he had been waiting for. The Buffalo crime boss instigated a rebellion by one of Joe's longtime captains, Gaspar Di Gregorio. Gaspar had been the best man at Joe's wedding and was the godfather of son Bill. The commission, now operating without Joe Bonanno, supported the uprising. The tension mounted when a rumor spread in New York that Joe Bonanno was planning to eliminate his adversaries by assassinating three of his fellow godfathers. The commission demanded that Joe come forward and explain himself. Fearing a trap, Joe refused. He denied the story, claiming that Magadino had concocted the tale in order to destroy him. All of the problems that developed between Bonanno's and the so-called commission 
were, could be laid directly at the doorstep of Steve Magadino. We caused our own downfall in that respect because it caused dissension among ourselves. By the fall of 1964, both the commission and the federal grand jury wanted answers from Bonanno. The Godfather was being squeezed by the mob and the law. Then he disappeared. On October 20th, 1964, the night before the scheduled grand jury hearing, Bonanno was kidnapped in front of his lawyer's apartment on Park Avenue. This man said, come on, Joe. My boss wants to talk to you. And with that, he swung Joe around, and I saw that he had a gun in his right hand. At first, it appeared that Bonanno had, in fact, been murdered. Soon, however, there was speculation that Joe had staged his own kidnapping to avoid both the government and his vicious enemies in the mob. In the classic gangster style, if you're taken for a ride, you're never seen again. Joe gets taken for a ride, he says, but he's not killed. Six weeks later, Joe contacted Bill at a payphone saying only that he was unharmed and in hiding. The FBI searched all over the world to find Joe Bonanno. Dozens of potential witnesses were subpoenaed, including Bill Bonanno and his younger brother, Joe Jr. When your brother made that phone call, were you glad to hear that your father was alive? No comment. In Joe's absence, the leader of the Bonanno family insurrection, Gaspar Di Gregorio, lured son Bill to a supposed peace meeting at this house in Brooklyn. When Bill arrived, Gaspar's gunman ambushed him. Shooting back and running for his life, Bill narrowly escaped. Hearing about the attempted hit on his son, a furious Joe Bonanno emerged from hiding after 18 months. He was tan and looked healthy as he showed up at the federal courthouse in New York saying, I understand you want to speak with me. The Godfather took the Fifth Amendment, sailed through the proceedings, and then focused on retribution in his own family. When he reappeared, it was like the second coming. First of all, no one expected him to ever reappear or be found, let alone emerge alive. Bonanno sent word to the commission that he was still in control of his family. He claimed he had been held captive for six weeks by his cousin, Magadino, who was trying to intimidate him into abandoning New York. The commission made no move for fear of starting another war. Joe's reputation as a street-fighting gangster dating all the way back to 1930 now insulated him. They ended up having enough doubt, at least, or enough fear of Joe Bonanno, depending on how you look at it, to not do what was the most obvious move, according to organized crime rules, which would be to kill him. But in an underworld that abhors any kind of power vacuum, Joe Bonanno's withdrawal from active leadership of his family had done irreversible damage. For the next two years, he would fight his own men and the ambitions of the other bosses who would try and take over his family limb by limb. Godfather Joe Bonanno emerged from hiding in 1966, ready to fight and kill to save his troubled crime family. An insurrection had split the family, and now the Mafia Commission was poised to take control of the Bonannos. Though he wanted to retire, Joe would not be dictated to by the Commission or anyone else. The street war, dubbed the banana split in the press, lasted for two years, a murder on one side calling for a retaliation from the other. Joe moved into the Long Island ranch house of his dutiful son Bill and daughter-in-law Rosalie. The house became Bonanno's war room and headquarters for the mob soldiers, who were still loyal to the Godfather and wanted to defend their turf. But in the spring of 1968, one of Bill Bonanno's closest associates was murdered, and it was rumored that he was next. Fearing for the safety of their families, the godfather and his son made a fateful decision. They would retreat to the west, where far from the street war, Joe's patient wife, Faye, was waiting. It gradually came to, to him, his consciousness, that it ain't worth it anymore. Shortly after returning to Arizona, the 73-year-old Bonanno suffered a heart attack. Joe's cousin, Stefano Magadino, also suffered a heart attack, 
and faded from power. Joe had no choice but to concede defeat to the rising mafia powerhouse, Carlo Gambino, who was now the dominant force on the commission. Joe agreed to be exiled from New York. In exchange, there would be no repercussions against any Bonanno family soldiers. Joe Bonanno, by the fact that he was banished and, you know, lived on for years, on the shelf is the organized crime term. And it's very rare, you know, you put a soldier on the shelf. It is very rare to put a boss on the shelf. And that's essentially what um, La Cosa Nostra did to Joe Bonanno. Leaving behind his failed kingdom in 1968, Joe hoped to live out his days in peace. But for the next 10 years, the FBI attempted to break Joe Bonanno using scare tactics, spies, and wiretapping. My father is fond of saying that he left Italy to get away from the fascists. And he came to this country and he ran smack into the Gestapo. In his old age, Joe Bonanno felt persecuted and misunderstood. He watched from afar as his former driver and captain, Carmine Galante, was murdered by his own men. The underlings wanted control of the heroin pipeline Galante had established. In time, they too were murdered, but the lucrative drug trade only expanded. Joe winced at every reference in the media to his family name, and he lamented the loss of loyalty, restraint, and discipline in his world. My dad told me many years ago that only a mad dog wants to hurt another human being without just cause. There is no tradition today on the streets. It's dog eat dog and hurt or be hurt. There's this constant distinction in the mafia between the rhetoric and the reality. The rhetoric is one of loyalty and tradition and order. The reality is constant competition and new generations coming along and wanting what the bosses have. In 1980, Joe's wife of 49 years passed away. Faye's last delirious words to Joe were, are they coming to get you? Joe became despondent. At 78 years old, the aging godfather wanted the world to know that he considered the current crop of mafiosi to be practicing a mutant form of his sacred tradition. In 1983, Bonanno announced he was doing something previously unheard of for a godfather. He was publishing his memoirs. The only person who can tell the story of a Joe Bonanno is a Joe Bonanno. He was the first and only one to write a book about the mob. Years ago, you did that. If you if even tried to do it, you'd be murdered. What Bonanno could not have anticipated was that an aggressive young district attorney would use his memoirs as ammunition. And Joe Bonanno, exiled by his peers 20 years earlier, would unwittingly have his revenge. In 1983, at 78 years old, Joe Bonanno's memoir about his life as a godfather called A Man of Honor was published. In the book, Joe referred to himself as the last survivor of an extinct species. He wrote, I've had to protect myself and my people, but I've never been bloodthirsty. All my life I've been misunderstood. I just uh, rule my family as a father. Rudy Giuliani had just become a U.S. attorney when a man of honor hit the bookstores. Giuliani was on a crusade against the mafia and did nothing but contempt for Bonanno's self-serving image of a godfather living by a code of honor. I have no romance about people involved in organized crime. They are uh, vicious, cold-blooded killers, and some of them are worse than others. Some of them really enjoy killing. But when Giuliani read Bonanno's book, something clicked. He realized that the Godfather's documented experience could be used as evidence that the commission existed and was responsible for half a century of murders and racketeering schemes. Unaware of Giuliani's plans, Joe Bonanno made an appearance on 60 Minutes to discuss his autobiography. He invited the camera crew to Christmas dinner at his daughter's home for a rare glimpse of his personal life. You know why? Because I love you all. Oh, here's Donna. 
Joe Bonanno tried to use the television appearance to show that he was not the mysterious crime figure that the media and law enforcement portrayed him to be. He was instead a man of honor. I was the most respected man in New York and all over the country. I came from the family of Bonanno, who has a great tradition in Sicily, and I came here with Hannah. U.S. Attorney Rudy Giuliani traveled all the way to Arizona with some questions of his own for the so-called Man of Honor. Thank you. Joe refused to talk, saying that the experience would pose a serious threat to his health. The judge rejected Bonanno's medical excuse, held him in contempt of court, and put him in jail for the next year and a half, his longest stay in prison. But he would not rat on his fellow mobsters. Still, his book, A Man of Honor, helped to convict more mafiosi than ever thought possible, diminishing the power of organized crime in New York City. And yet, the family that Joe Bonanno built not only survives to this day, but is flourishing. And the Bonanno crime family, a family that had had all the trouble over the years, they're in better shape right now than any other organized crime family in New York or probably the country. Joe Bonanno, now 93 years old and a great-grandfather, is the only surviving godfather from the original commission created in 1931. His life encompasses nearly a century of mafia history. Bonanno has never been touched, never been an attempt made on his life, because he's an original. He's a charter member of the mafia commission in this country. Nobody's going to take him out. As Joe's oldest son, Bill Bonanno has lived in the long shadow cast by his father. Yet where there might have been resentment, there is great love and acceptance of his fate. I am not ashamed of who I am or what I am. I've accepted the life that was handed to me and I've tried to do the best that I can. After spending a decade in and out of jail on conspiracy charges and tax evasion, Bill eventually became a television producer, focusing on stories about his family. My dad's philosophy was, you have a right to lead your life the way you want to lead it, as long as you are responsible for the decisions that you make and assume the consequences of those decisions. Joe was, I think, a very successful leader. He did do a good job in keeping the families operating in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Where is the real honor in an organization where you take a sworn oath of secrecy and your official job is to go out to double-cross, to double-deal, to steal, to murder, to intimidate, to frighten? In his memoirs, Joe wrote that he leaves it to God to decide the true definition of honor.